Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Cassidy Diamond, and I am the Public Programs and Events Manager here at the International Documentary Association. Good to see you all again. Um, really excited for this conversation uh, for the film The Reason I Jump, moderated by IndieWire's Ann Thompson. Um, before we get started, uh, we'll start as always uh, with a land acknowledgement and Usually I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, um, but today I'm coming to you from Chicago, which is on the land of the Three Fires people, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Bod Bodawatomi. Sorry, apologies. Um, and before we get started, I also want to thank IndieWire um, our, for our media support and support from KCRW as well. Um, to find out more screenings um, that we have running through the end of January and amazing conversations like this one, you can go to documentary.org slash screening series. And without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Ann Thompson. Welcome. Oh, we've got you on mute, Ann. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the IDA screening series. I wish you could all be with me in person, but we're going to talk about The Reason I Jump, which uh, won the World Cinema Documentary Award at Sundance. And with us, we have the director, Jerry Rothwell, and David Mitchell, who is a participant, a very important participant in the movie. Welcome. Hi, good to be here. You're on mute, David. Uh, so I am. There you go. I'm there here. You now. Go. Hey. Here we are. It's the state of things. <laughs> so I'm actually um, very curious to know, um, Jerry, how you found out about this uh, book. I have to imagine that David uh, translated, or how how did you two find out about each other and this this extraordinary book? Well, David, I mean, maybe David, maybe you should, since you found it first, you should uh, go for it. You know. Okay. Uh, well, my wife found it first. Uh, so we have uh, an autistic son. Uh, at the time, he was about three or four and things were pretty tough. Uh, my wife's Japanese and uh, many of the books we'd found about autism and autism parenting in English were written either by um, academics who had studied autism for many years or by the parents like us of autistic kids uh, or by... I dislike the word, but I can't think of a better substitute right now, high functioning uh, autistic people who were young adults or adults writing about autism from their perspective. What we didn't have uh, was any firsthand insight by a nonverbal autistic young person uh, closer in the years uh, to our son than say to ourselves. And then one day my wife came across uh, this book, The Reason I Jump in its Japanese language edition. Uh, and she ordered a copy and the morning it arrived, she started reading it. And soon she was translating sections across the breakfast table uh, at me because many of its author's uh, insights about autism were directly applicable to our son. Of course, not everything. Uh, the old adage that if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person is quite true. Uh, however, um, a lot was applicable and helpful to our son. Of course, we became interested in the author, who at the time of writing the book was a 13-year-old boy. Uh, not three or four, but a lot closer to three or four than to our ages. Uh, he was also, like our son, uh, nonverbal. Now, nonverbal, I should say, at, uh, at the top is quite a, a contentious um, phrase with many meanings. Um, uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, we could say perhaps non-conversant. So while there's a lot of knowledge about language, um, the neurology in the brain that enables a person to do what we're doing now, uh, to, to converse, this appears to be um, 
misfiring or lacking or not jumbled. functioning uh, in jumbled in what we'd call a nonverbal autistic person's brain. Um, how did Naoki write the book? If he's, as the terminology goes, severely or profoundly autistic. Uh, we know because he tells us, um, he writes by pointing to a, an alphabet grid or letterboard of the Japanese alphabet and voicing the syllables of the words he is pointing to one by one and building up sentences in this way. A transcriber uh, writes these down or he can write directly onto a computer keyboard. Uh, this can be a little bit trickier because of the way that Japanese keyboards work. There are more distractions. So he tends to prefer the letterboard. Uh, the book itself is in the form of about 50 or 55 questions that he's heard asked about autistic people. He's heard, he's, he's um, been asked himself or that he imagines us neurotypical people would be interested in. Uh, he answers them. Um, why do you flap your hands? Uh, why do you have meltdowns? Um, how do you perceive time? What is memory like? These questions um, and many others. Uh, and he answers them. Uh, it's, 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 it's a short book. It's a concise book um, necessarily because of the way it's written. It's not a rambling book. It's very direct. Uh, and it was extremely helpful for us. Uh, it, it, um, it demolished a couple of myths for us. Uh, and the myths were that autistic people have little or no emotional intelligence. And that, I think maybe that's the main one. So you were able to um, see your son that, in this book. You were able to learn things about your son that you didn't know. Yes, yes, it uh, somewhat altered the way we thought about autism. And as, and as a result of that alteration, we began seeing and interacting with our son in several different ways. Uh, these in turn kicked off something of a virtuous spiral. Uh, our son could understand that we were understanding him in a different way. And this affected some of his more uh, self-destructive habits, tendencies in a very, in a very positive way. Now, of course, I'm not saying the book is a magic bullet. Um, of course, I'm not saying it's some sort of instant cure, but knowledge is a wonderful thing. Knowledge itself is a powerful thing. And it gave us knowledge we wouldn't have otherwise had. Uh, I'm well, taking up a lot of time on this. No, I will it's speed all up. good. Uh, One just... of the things about the film that I found <laughs> so powerful is the idea of, of the question of who tells the story. And you must have mm. recognized that there might be a story that you wanted to share with a larger group of people. Uh, Immediately, uh, we, yeah, please. No, no, go for it. Okay. Was that, we asked Okay, uh, just really quickly. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry, Anne. Was that question to me or to Jerry or to both of no, us? No, it's to you first, and then to then we'll get Jerry. Okay. Um, sure. Well, my wife and I uh, translated the book initially just for the people who work with our son because we badly wanted them to hear firsthand from another autistic, nonverbal kid. Uh, what we had learned from the book and as it was only available in Japanese at the time there was no option other than to translate it kind of illegally um, just on um, handwritten bits of paper which I then typed up which we gave to our son's teachers uh, and carers because I just said you, you really have to read this because it's quite transformative in how you in how one sees autism um, and you cannot read it and think the same way. Uh, 
and uh, and you interact with autistic people in a different way as a result of reading this book, I think, at least we did. Uh, so uh, we did this Sam is that this sort of slightly underground translation uh, of of the book. Um, then one day I mentioned it to my editor and my agent, and they said, uh, "Well, could could we have a look at this?" Um, so it was quite accidental, almost. Uh, I gave them a copy, and they expressed a very strong interest immediately in publishing it and bringing it to a wider market. But it was actually my agent and my editor who deserve the credit for recognizing the obvious, I suppose, that, uh, that uh, this book um, could help many parents of autistic, of autistic kids and not just us. What was the impact that the book had? Thank you for had? listening to all no, of that. No, 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 st I still want, <laughs> um, so Jerry, how did you find out about this book? So I, I came to the project through the producers um, who, who's, who also have an autistic son who's in the film, um, uh, Jeremy and, and Stevie. Uh, and there's a third producer who I should mention, Al Morrow. But I, and I guess when I sort of first read the book, um, you know, I'd, I'd worked in the past, made films around the theme of autism in, in the past and, and, you know, but still for me, it had lots of revelations in it. Um, and I guess my first instinct was to go and meet with Naoki and and try a film, try think try thinking about a film about you know a young boy who finds his voice. Uh, and Naoki uh, had an amazing sort of few days with Naoki uh, uh, as he as uh, doing sort of you know conversations with him using the letterboard. Um, and he was very happy with the idea of the project, but had kind of one rule, which was that he didn't want to be in it. Um, which How old through. is he now? How old is he now? He's 26. Yeah. Wow. So um, and, is there a shot written, of him? He has written several books since. Yeah. At the end, did you get one exterior shot of him at the end? No, that's that at the very end of the film. Um, no, there is no, there's no shots of him in the film. No. no. And so you got the little Japanese boy uh, to act yeah, so as, I suppose as that, that decision was, um, you, you know, as soon as, as soon as we knew that kind of Naki didn't want to be in the film, then it was really, it actually pushed the film, I think, into a much more interesting and creative zone um, and much less kind of conventional zone. Which, so I'm very grateful in a way for him, him taking that decision. Um, I guess then creatively the difficulty was, okay, if we're going to use Naki's words as a way of helping us, helping immerse us in the lives of different non-speaking people around the world, which was sort of what I wanted to do. How do we make sure that those people are not just kind of illustrations of Naoki's book? You know, because because as David says, you know, each person has their own individuality, their own kind of uh, set of, of kind of both, you know, abilities and challenges. And I didn't want it to be a case where, you know, you'd, you'd have a bit of book and then you'd go and see someone and, and, uh, and they would illustrate it. Um, so it felt that we needed a place within the film for the book that was not in the observational documentary. And that's where really the idea of this young boy who could be Naoki, could be like a, a representation of the book in some ways, uh, but certainly maybe an, an idea of, this, of, the, of, of where this voice is coming from on a journey through landscape and as he explores that landscape. And we were really lucky to find Jim Fujiwara, who is a, a young non-speaking autistic Japanese mm. boy in the UK, you know, which was our requirements. I think I must have met every non-speaking Japanese boy who lives in the UK. Um, and he's lovely. He was fantastic. And, and, and really, I mean, in, you know, we kind of worked with Jim, not in a, he wasn't a, a, an a actor, you know, we were, we, would, we were working with him in a documentary way in those environments, but, but we're, that was able to be a place where, where the book kind of found its, its place in the film. And who was reading the book? So another young autistic uh, actor, um, uh, uh, um, oh God, sorry, John. I keep I keep wanting to say Jason Donovan, but I'm not. <laughs> Jason J o, o Donovan, I think it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and so he yeah he did a sort of great job of kind of voicing that kind of intimacy of the, of the book. So several of the subjects are friends, are children of your friends, or you um, knew them. No, I mean the 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 with it so that 
uh, no, jo Justin the film is, the, is the son of the producers. Um, Amra, so, so in terms of finding people to right. be in the film, um, you know, really, I felt that the book has this shape, you know, and it takes you into a, it sort of begins by kind of immersing you in, in Naoki's sensory world in a way he starts to describe the way he sees sort of detail instead of the big picture or the way sounds appear to him. And so I felt like that's what the film needed to do to begin by kind of taking us into this sensory, a different sensory world. Um, and, uh, you know, um, we found this Amrit who's a visual artist in India and it felt that she was a kind of good person to take us into that world through her art partly or through her communication through her art. Um, and then and then Joss, we were able to film with it because he was UK based and, and um, you know, I had a contact with him over quite a long period of time. We were able to shoot something kind of much more longitudinal and intimate in a way with Joss. And then I was looking for sort of people who were maybe more in the kind of political advocacy end, which is where I found Ben and Emma in the States. And then I'd already been shooting in, in Sierra Leone on a project and was, was interested in, in the film exploring autism in Africa as well, uh, in an African country and, and came across Mary uh, and her daughter. Mary had been doing this amazing work with communities in Sierra Leone around autism. No, it worked. It worked. You were able to sort of combine a, this this narration with the uh, it, it, the imagery of of what might be inside someone's head uh, with what you observed uh, in the children. And it is very innovative. It must have been difficult to put together and uh, and make it work in the editing room. I think it's, I mean, I think, to, to, as you say, it's kind of like, it, or, or maybe imply, and I think correctly, this is all guesswork, you know, like we don't <laughs> really know how any, I don't know how you see the world, you know, you don't really know how I see the world. And so, so I think what we're trying to do with an audience is just take them into a, a slightly non-neurotypical way of looking at things based on the insights both from Nauki and also we worked with an advisory group of autistic people in the UK so that was kind of where those ideas you know the springs the springboard for those ideas and then and then yeah for me uh, you know most of my films are fairly story-led they're quite verbal you know to work in something that was kind of very non-verbal and and doesn't have a linear story in it was was challenging uh you know, the book is a set of, as David says, a set of 58 questions and answers. It's like trying to make a, you know, I don't know, make a film out of a, of a kind of manual for, for something with, uh, out of Q&A. Um, but that was also very freeing. Mosaic, know. if I may say, Jeremy. Hmm? A mosaic, exactly, yeah. yeah. So Dave, um, a mosaic. So, so David, mosaic. Uh, um, as I said before, uh, I mean, I think what I felt watching this was that I was being given a window uh, into understanding um, the minds of some autistic folks in a way that I never, ever, ever would have understood before. And I feel very um, uh, blessed to have been able to see it. Um, so it really is the question of who tells the story and, and how, did you, um, how did you help Jerry to, to, to see some of the things, some of the facets of this story that might be important to capture? I think we sort of tried to take an approach. Not sure how was... much I did. <laughs> Sorry, Jerry, after you. Yeah, yeah. No, you did loads. Your turn. Um, the, I think, I, think <laughs> I was going to say that I think we had an approach that was quite um, non-directive. I mean, and so, so in a way, sort of truly documentary, although the film in the end doesn't maybe feel like a traditional doc, doc but but we, you know, I think what we didn't want to do was was impose a set of images on this text. We wanted to spend time with people, kind of immerse ourselves in their world and find within those worlds the imagery and the sounds that uh, that you know could could um, bear out some of the some of Nauki's ideas or that Nauki's ideas could could throw some light on. So it was very much like a tiny crew. Just me, uh, sound recorder's camera and assistant, and we we spent time with people and really kind of hung with them as we observed their world, I guess. And that that and when it came to an edit, 
you know, bizarre situation of like pretty much any shot could have followed any other shot. So it's it's it was kind of an unusual unusual edit because it didn't have a kind of story drive to it, but it has a, a shape and a tension to it, but it's not narrative tension, I think is right. Well, one of the you. chilling things in the movie is when you find some of the um, um, the experts uh, from the past explaining to us uh, what the uh, psychology uh, and 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 pathology of of autism actually was back then, and it's it, we've come a long way uh, in just a recent amount of time. David, you you must have a sense of of how, uh, how things have changed in terms of how people look at this, especially the nonverbal people. Oh, yes, um, there is a history of autism. There's even a prehistory of autism um, where folks wrote accounts in the, 19th, in, in, in the 18th, 17th century about what might have been called back then the village idiots, uh, but, from their, but, but, but from a description of their, of their behaviors, um, many were quite clearly autistic, or if they were alive now, they would receive this diagnosis. Uh, of course, their lives tended not to go very well. Um, neurotypical people instinctively create a world where you can only claim your civic rights, your human rights, uh, if you can claim them in neurotypical terms with language. Uh, and if you can't, you are kind of at the mercy of whatever system happens to be around uh, where and when you are born. And for most of, um, for most of history, those systems either did, did not exist or were, um, or were cruel or sadistic or punitive. Uh, so, I guess autistic people who were born into relatively wealthy countries uh, in the modern era are kind of the lucky ones in terms of the whole um, historical continuum of autism. Uh, even within our own lifetimes, it has changed uh, as recently as the eighties. Um, it was believed um, by mainstream medical opinion that autism was caused by uh, the refrigerator mothers. Uh, it wasn't a, uh, a neurological thing at all. It was mothers not caring either consciously or unconsciously uh, for their children enough. Um, this is very well um, illustrated in some recent books, uh, Neurotribes or um, Andrew Solomon's Far From The Tree. Um, so, so yes, things have improved. Um, I'd also want to make the point, uh, I don't want to rubbish experts. Um, I, I, I want them to exist. I want for, uh, bright young researchers to see that there's, uh, uh, that there's a fulfilling and valid career in autism research, because this is the only way things do improve. Uh, however, it is it is important that uh, that uh, uh, this is true of all science in all areas, but that how we think something works does not make us partial or prejudiced or unable to see how something does work. Uh, I'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible here. Um, but um, I hope that this film will, will perhaps be at the vanguard of the next sort of evolutionary step in uh, how society at large sees autism, particularly non-verbal autism. Um, the narrative is always shifting. We hope it shifts in a more enlightened direction uh, but that is only the case when um, when we hear directly from um, uh, from 
people with autism uh, themselves. And of course, it's the nature of nonverbal autism for this voice to be very hard to hear. Right. Uh, however, I hope that uh, the film will do some of um, this important work. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so how has COVID affected uh, the trajectory of this movie reaching the world? Um, Jerry, tell us. <laughs> well, you know, we were really lucky um, to have been able to screen film at Sundance and, um, you know, that was very exciting and a great launch had for the film and Ben and Emma from the film came there and did some fantastic kind of Q and A's and, and then sort of, I think we, uh, our second festival was in Prague and, and was shut down sort of in the middle of, uh, of the festival. And so since then really we've, you know, we've not, we've, we've done some virtual festivals. Um, we're about to be in Doc NYC, I guess by the time this goes out, we'll have been in Doc NYC. Um, but yeah, it's been, I, I suppose that thing that you get from from the, the, the physical showing of a film in a collective space with other people and that engagement with an audience that who have just gone through the same experience as each other, you know, is something you just can't match virtually, I don't think. Um, yeah. And something that's kind of, yeah, I really hope we get a chance to do that. About three weeks ago, we showed the film at Athens Film Festival and I went and it was an outdoor screening, outdoor, some outdoor screenings. And it was just fantastic to be able to, you know, to have that uh, conversation with an audience uh, live after watching the film. But, no, the, the extraordinary thing about this is that you feel like this, this could just have an, an enormous impact on the real world, that you're showing people things that, they, that they've never seen before and a point of view that they've never experienced before. And I just think it could be quite huge. Um, the other thing um, that you did uh, was work with the sound um, in, in the movie. Uh, I think you, 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 given that you haven't got a lot of verbal, <laughs> or verbal and uh, you know expression to work with, you could able, you could go for um, images and sound, and and you you did take that uh, as far as you could, right? Yeah, I mean it's a, it's it's an important part of the book and of other accounts by um, non-speaking autistic people that the experience of sound and of, of distraction as well. And so fairly early on, we, I was working with um, sound designer Nick Ryan, who, who's himself synesthetic, which is very common in, in non-speaking people, uh, autistic people, um, where the, 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 the sort of links between, there's a sort of fusion of the links between vision and, and sound. Um, I is that Nick, Nick Ryan? Nick Ryan? Yeah. Nick Ryan, yeah. And yeah. I think he brought, he, he immediately said, oh, well, you're going to do it in 360, aren't you? And I was going like, oh, what's that? Yes, of course we are, sort of thing. <laughs> and and um, so we decided to, to really build the sound from the beginning, even before we started shooting uh, in a 360 environment, which means you can place the sound anywhere in the cinema. Um, and so our sound recorders was kind of running 16 tracks of audio in all of these environments that we were with people. And, and then Nick did this incredible job really of bringing those sounds from the, the real environments we'd been shooting in and kind of just turning them a bit so that, uh, for example, Naki talks about the experience of, of rain and of how he needs to go through his memory uh, every kind of visual memory of rain in order to understand the sound of rain, the sound that, that, that it's raining. And so Nick took um, the sound of rain. There's a moment where one of our, our characters in the film is, is in the rain, it's observing rain. And Nick sort of took lots of sounds that aren't rain, but were analogous to rain and placed them around the cinema. So it's like at one moment you're, everything sounds like rain, but it's actually crinkling paper or it's tapping on a table or it's, uh, and, and I think that that sound world he's created is just incredibly sort of immersive and, and, and changes the way you look at the film as well. Um, so again, slight, slight lack of a shame that we're not in cinemas with it, but we've made a- I would like to work. see it again in, in yeah. the proper way, because <laughs> I can we've tell you my sound system yeah, isn't uh, giving me what you're describing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's unfortunate. We, we made a sort of binaural mix for headphones, which um, I think actually the version that IDA is showing is, is the binaural one. So if, if you listen on headphones, there's a kind of equivalent to that, but not quite, it's full, it's full surroundness. 
Well, one of um, one of the things that I know a lot of autistic parents are haunted by, uh, I mean, parents of autistic children are haunted by is the whole um, oh, how unprofessional, um, the whole question of how uh, their children are going to grow up without them. And you end the film, uh, I wondered, uh, how did those um, those two friends uh, who were going to move into the apartment building, how did that story conclude uh, or go on? So, so yeah, so Ben and Emma did mo have moved into flats that are opposite each other in that in that supported ha housing environment. So they've moved away from home. Um, they're loving it, I think. Oh, um, good. Which is great. And it's, it, yeah, sometimes we've, we've been doing sort of virtual Q and A's with them where they're each in their own apartment across the corridor. And uh, yeah, it's been really lovely to see. I mean, I, don't, I think probably as a parent, David, that, that must really kind of, the, the, they, they sort of model uh, a, a, a way of being in the world as a young adult, I think, which is incredible. And David? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, I do think about what you just mentioned, Anne, uh, a lot. And it gives hope that it is possible. Uh, ben and Emma's experience, I mean. Uh, of course, you also need uh, to live in a society that makes it possible. And that is more true of some societies than others. And you have to be able to afford it, even. Yeah, I mean, in that yes. case, it's a, it's, it's a housing association. But oh, yeah, that's good. But absolutely, but yeah, you know, what? How many societies have that kind of supported housing available? You know, and that, and they've worked for years and years to get that supported housing going. In in there, you know, so it's the product of a lot of hard community action to make that happen. So what's next for the film? Kino Lorber is taking it out and uh, yeah, presumably so, uh, to virtual cinemas and real ones as well. Real ones, hopefully, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, uh, uh, it's cinema release in the US is on the 8th of January um, and in the UK in the spring. Um, so we're, we're sort of building up to that. And, and in the meantime, it's screening at a number of festivals. And then after, after the cinema release, we'll be, you know, trying to, use the film for as much, to have as much impact as possible and, and the kind of you know on, on those opportunities for education housing kind of good social policy where, where we where we've got a kind of outreach program planned around that all right well thank you gentlemen this was a fascinating uh window as i said i i was very glad to see this and um I, I hope uh, you can take it out as far as you can with, with public outreach. Um, thank you for helping us out. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us.